So what I'd like to do next is have you share some of the ideas that came up in your groups. I didn't get to sit in on your groups as much and would like to know, you know, what were some of the big ideas? You know, I asked you to reflect on disruptive innovations that would help to not only disrupt systems but also um, transform them. I'm not into disrupting for the purpose of disrupting. I want to transform them towards something that's more effective. So some of the questions had to do with what outcomes matter to you, how are systems perfectly designed to get the outcomes that you don't want, and what are your, some thoughts you might have in terms of uh, ways to disrupt or to re-engineer a system, a, a, pa a care pathway, um, that would actually maybe perhaps result in a different outcome or a more desirable outcome. So to get the emphasis off of thinking about changing people so much and think about systems and workflows and care pathways. So I'm wondering, I, I know we had four groups break out and I um, would invite a representative from each group to give us an idea of what, uh, what you all were coming up with. Do you want to start, David, since you were sitting in on your group? Do you want to use this so we can hear you? Come on up. I, I hope I will be able to represent more or less what came up in the group. But in general, it initially evoked some degree of uh, pessimism and sense of helplessness. Uh, a little bit, uh, folks feeling a little bit overwhelmed and almost speechless about how to deal with these big questions. And um, and then one of the ma major issues that came up was the issue of, of a fragmented system and how do you actually try to deal with some of the challenges that came out of those questions within a, within a system that's so fragmented as not well coordinated and without and sort of what echoed a little bit was the things that you were talking about earlier about how actually to change systems. You emphasized the issue of uh, the leadership, the supervision, and the funding. Uh, funding. Uh, so it was hard for us to find how those different elements actually could enhance and uh, help integrate the, the fragmented services. So after the initial sense of uh, some degree of helplessness, uh, some ideas began to be, came up by group members, including coming up with a uh, sort of a, uh, a figure, a role of someone who would be, a men would be like a mental health consultant from day one. That would be the person that would be, uh, that the person could meet and uh, get the initial message, um, have their power statement, work on the power statement, that person would be able to uh, facilitate and assist the, per assist the person as he or she goes along between these fragmented services to try to create some degree of continuity and integration. Uh, there was also concern that how feasible that is and what happens when a person actually gets into many different services and then is exposed to many different messages. There was also an idea about trying to empower and help the actually consumer themselves for them to take the role of holding the flag and the, and the and the, the statement and everything. And the question was, was it putting too much weight and responsibility and, and in a, in a, in a uh, system in which everyone's lost, why should that person out of all people be the one who now is responsible for holding it all up? And finally, the, the last thing that came up was uh, an idea of a little bit inspired from what you were saying, take one place and try to make it work out. So taking one different fun, uh, insurance company that would that would be willing to go on, I won't say the word pilot because you said how you don't go into pilots anymore, it's not a good idea, but it, to be willing to, that has the power to try to uh, see a person along the continuum of a lot of different services and try to create um, um, a more integrated system of care which this would effort would be implemented and that would be a place to start out. So we ended uh, with that uh, with that place. Okay. Well, that's great work. I mean, I want to speak to uh, for a minute about the issue of the feeling of powerlessness or helplessness that sometimes happens when we think about really big systems, right? Big systems of care. We think about insurance companies. We think about health ministries. I mean, it can be overwhelming, and we can feel very small, right? Um, but this is where the idea of leadership comes in, and my firm belief is that every single one of us here in this room is a leader. 
because frankly, they don't pay us enough money. <laughs> really? You know, it's not the money that we're in this for, are we? I mean, money's nice. I don't have anything against money, but that's not why we come to work every day, is it? So one of the things that I do in mental health systems is work with um, staff to discover what we call the story, my story of why. My story of why I come to work every day. And it's a very important story to have at our disposal, especially when we're feeling small and relatively helpless <clears throat> in relation to larger systems, right? And I think <clears throat> a good leader, a leader, as I said, is not about your position as a CEO or a director or a health minister. Leadership isn't a title. <clears throat> it's a way of behaving. And what do great leaders have? When, when, I, you know, when I think about great leaders, I think about people, for me, that are heroes, uh, people like uh, Martin Luther King in the United States, who of course led the civil rights movement, or Nelson Mandela, or other great leaders <clears throat> in our world. And what do you and I have in common with those great, great ones? You know, what do we have in common with them? And the truth is, if we think about our story of why, we actually have a lot in common. What really makes a great leader great? Most of us tend to catch on to great leaders further down the line when they're winning awards and, and uh, Nobel Peace Prizes and other accolades, other wonderful, you know. But that's way far down the line. I think about Martin Luther King in a jail in Birmingham, Alabama, in the segregated South, where racism is written into the laws of the state. And he's sitting in a jail cell, and he's having his mug, we call it a mug shot taken. It's the picture they take of you when you're a prisoner. And when you look at that picture, he looks directly into the camera, but his face is weary, and he looks small. We're used to the images of Dr. King as, I have a dream, <clears throat> of course. But <clears throat> he was not a great man at that time. He wasn't a world famous leader. He was just a person like you and like me. And he was scared. He was scared. I like to say, what is this thing we call courage? And I think courage is an attribute that we attribute to a person from the outside. I might say, he's in a jail cell. He was arrested during a noble civil rights march. He's a courageous man. But his experience is, I'm scared. I could be killed here. And no one will know, right? And no one will know. They will, they will make up stories about how I took my own life or what I fell. And he's looking into that camera, and he's frightened. So to be courageous, I think, sometimes means to continue to act even though we are afraid, even though we feel small. But why do we do that? Well, I believe that a great leader like Martin Luther King is someone who sees a gap, a big space, something missing. Martin Luther King says, there's a gap between what is what is is segregation, what is is institutionalized racism, what is is the legacy of slavery, what is is white supremacy. That's what is. And then he dares to ask, what should be? What should be? There is what it is and what should be, okay? And there's a gap. A leader is one who can see the gap between what is and what should be and has a vision, has a vision about how to begin to close that gap, okay? And it's that vision, that vision that brings us to this work and keeps us in this work. It is not the paycheck. It is not the paycheck. It is a vision that um, I don't know what your vision is. <laughs> I'd love to hear each of your vision. I have a vision that what is is that people are being drugged, including myself, drugged 
to a state of chemical stupor in the name of help. And what should be is that people should be able to pick up their lives again and fulfill their human potential. That's what should be. What is, is that too often people are receiving help that hurts, their voice is not being heard. What should be is that people should be heard. Their voice should be at the center of the care team, the center of the rehab team. The voice of the individual is what unites all the services. That's why I love power statements, right? We take what, we see what is, but we dare to imagine what should be, and we dedicate ourselves to closing the gap. That's where our power is. That's where our passion is. That's why we do what we do. Now, I don't know what brings you or you or you exactly to this work. But what I do know is what brings you to this work is that somewhere along the line, you know what it means to be wounded. You know what it means to suffer a loss. You know what it means to be knocked down by life in such a way that you thought maybe you couldn't get back up again. Maybe you saw your father struggling with alcoholism and felt humiliated when he would pick you up at a school dance and would be intoxicated. I don't know what your story is. I don't know about the wounds that you have, but what I know is because you pa made a passage through what was hard in your own life, maybe you lost a child to cancer, I don't know. But whatever it is, that journey you made lit in you a hope, a flame, okay? And somehow, you know, just FYI, the rest of the world kind of doesn't like those of us with serious mental illness, but you're here, why? Why? They don't pay you enough, why are you here? Why are you gonna get up tomorrow morning and go to work? Why, what is your why? Your why is that somehow you know something. Put words to what you know. What's the gap you see? between what is and what should be, and what's your dream about how to close that gap. It might be help should not hurt. Maybe that's how you want to begin to close the gap. Maybe that's the gap you see, okay? So I don't know exactly what it is that brings you to the work, but I know why you stay. Because you have a story. Because you have a story of why. Your why, right? And what I do in working with mental health system staff sometimes is bring staff together to share stories of why. Because I can work next to my coworker for 30 years and never know why they get up every morning and come to work. When staff begin to share their story of why, and I don't mean disclose our deepest secrets and personal, that's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about my why. Where's the place inside of you when you're feeling weary, when yet another stupid policy comes down from on high, when yet more funding is cut, and you just go, I don't know how we're gonna make it. I don't know how we're gonna to do this. They've just cut the funding in half. You can downsize a budget, but you can't downsize human need. You feel that outrage coming up? That outrage is the gasoline in our blood, right? It, it, it is the fire in our soul. And it's a precisely that that will keep us fueled and able to lead. What does a leader do? A leader says, I see a possibility for something other than a gap. I see a possibility. I'm going to help birth. I'm going to help bring into existence solutions that begin to close the gap between what is and what should be. And you, we would be megalomaniacal to think that uh, we could somehow individually, solo, yeah, I'll do it all by myself. Mm -mm. It's gonna take all of us. But we rarely talk about this. What's your story of why? What brings you to this work? Why do you come back the next day? And what's the possibility you see one of the ways this is talked about in leadership circles is that people sometimes talk about leaders as the ones who see the possibility rather than the probability. 
the probability is that things will continue to be dysfunctional in the system. And there are all those people who'll tell you that, right? Oh, it's just the system again. Oh. Those people we so much don't need, right? Those people aren't leading and they'll be gone soon. They can't last. We last because we see that there is a possibility. We do not buy into the probability that nothing will change ever. Rather, we have a vision of what is possible. Now, I know at one point in my life, you know, when I was first coming into the field that I felt like, well, I felt like I could save one person at a time. You know, one person at a time I would try to connect with, or, you know? But then over time, and that was a good place to start, but over time, I've begun to think differently and have been sharing with you some of the ideas I have. Instead of thinking that it was my job to change systems or to change the way professionals think about recovery, what kind of tools can I build that will empower people sitting in waiting rooms, twiddling their thumbs in a, in a fragmented system that will empower them to make the system connect? What might work? I don't know in Israel. That's your job. Okay, I don't even know in the United States, of course, even, but I'm trying, and I'm showing somebody's, and there are so many of us out there trying to do this. We're not alone, which is the good news. So I didn't mean to take that big diversion, but I wanted to share with it, you with it, that even if we do feel really small, and we do feel really um, helpless, we are not. And it's a precisely that story of why, it's precisely that vision, being able to see the possibility, not the probability, the possibility of what can happen, and to hold that vision. And then when we get weary, and when we get tired, and when we want to fall down and say, I quit, I'm out of here, where's my retirement, get me going. You know, when we say, I've had it, not another change, not another policy, um, where do we go? We go in to our story of why, and we remember what it is we're carrying, the gift that we're carrying, and we recommit. It's like having rocket fuel. And if we go back to that well, we can draw that water up, right, and renew ourselves and move forward. And that's really, I think, what leadership is all about. That's what really good leaders can do. And FYI, um, our current leader in America is not particularly that, that person. He just isn't inspiring that in us. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I just wanted to offer that um, to remember your power and remember where your power comes from, okay? That you have a gift and you're bearing that gift and you've earned that gift because you've been through your own passage and you're passing it on to others, whether you're supervising them, teaching them, you know, and you're passing that on. And that's power. And don't let anyone tell you you don't have power because you do. And together, we can make something happen. All right, we had a second group that was sitting over here. Would somebody like to report out from that group? Can you take the mic so we can all hear? That'd be helpful. I guess. The board isn't long enough. To, it would be helpful. OK, so we had. Uh Um, so we're asking, like each one said, what outcomes do we want to see? So we had um, people were talking about uh, satisfaction in life. Um, people were talking about uh, self-management. Oh, we were talking about wellness. Singur atzmiy chomrim beanglit. Self advocacy. Um, what else did we have? Uh, hope, dreams. Uh, we're talking about self-efficacy. I think we said most of the things. Um, so these are the outcomes that we were looking for. Um, and then there was a, what? Okay, and I don't know. I hope I know where I'm going, okay. And then the second question was, okay, so where do we want to implement these things? Um, so there were a couple of things that came up with. So first of all, most of the people were talking about implementing it with the people themselves, okay, with those who have uh, the mental illness. But then there were people that said, no, I think we also have to work with the 
the people who provide the um, the service, but not, she was she wasn't talking about the psychiatrists or the social workers. We we're talking about um, um, like counselors. So you have the psychiatrists, you have the social workers, whatever, and then there are the counselors that work with the people. And a lot of times, maybe the social workers are coming from an empowerment point or whatever, and but but the the counselors who are the ones who do the day-to-day -day work, they're not in that place. So maybe to work with them. Um, and then there was a question if we want to implement it in um, rehabilitation services, or if we want to maybe implement it. My guy, can what's him like you? Can. Ah, okay. Um, so we were talking about if we want to implement it, uh, the program, these services in um, the rehabilitation services, but then some people said no, in the rehabilitation services, people are already in the system and it's very hard to change the way they think. So maybe let's try to get the people before they get into the system, earlier on, on their way. That's what we got to, we still didn't come, we didn't have enough time to come up with the ideas, okay, so what do we want to do? But at least we know the outcomes that we want to get to and where do we want to implement it. Okay. Well done. Beautiful. Very good. Okay, um, and I know we had two groups that were outside the room. Could I have a representative from one of the two groups that was not in this room? Beautiful. Thank you so much. So um, actually, um, we thought about that. Um, they told me that we are um, we are after you. So let's see if it's if it goes like that. So first of all, the outcomes that we wanted to achieve was were the the, the things that you you uh, suggested about the giving voice and choice for people, and we decided to implement it to. Uh, services that is already oriented into recovery. So we decided to take the, the, the Sal Shikun Committee and how you prepare the people to the Sal Shikun Committee. Mm -hmm. And we decided to take the, the, the peer support before the committee, before they go to the committee, how to give voice and choice and to have the time to proceed and to think together about their wishes, hopes, and wills and goals, and then also then they go into the the, um, the committee, and so the committee will ask for these um, achievements or what they learned before even the committee uh, decide or get together, and then we decided that it's not enough because sometimes after the committee ends, the people just live there, stay there, and they don't know where to go and what to do with the, the decisions that made, that had made. So we decided that they will go again to this peer support or maybe we'll build a center of peer support to, to have the opportunity or to open the possibilities of what's go, what they will do with these decisions. Okay? So thank you. It was a wonderful... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's rather brilliant, I think. And um, talk about decision support, right? We talked about a unique, unduplicated role for peers in the decision support centers. And decision support centers can be virtual as well. The part that becomes important is making sure that your peer supporter workforce, whether they're in a central place or they're able to go out to the person's home and be with them, or both, right, um, uh, have the tools and skill sets they would need to support someone in the decision-making process. But couldn't you just see the power statement working out really nicely in that? Yes, it would work very well. But it would only be the, it would only be the beginning. It would only be the very beginning. To change, the thing is to change the process, because some, a lot of the times, although the idea is to come ready to the committee and to know what you want to ask, and there is in the forms, there is a place for the person to voice their uh, goals, but in the end, because the way the system is built and the, the people sometimes that have to uh, help the person uh, coming to the committee, they don't get sometimes paid for the 
sessions, you know, for uh, helping them design. So using those, maybe those centers to do some of the work together and helping the person, you know, prepare for these uh, encounters. I think it's like what you said about people sitting around and waiting for their uh, appointments. Yeah, oh, brilliant. Yeah, voice choice and preparing to participate in making decisions. And then, of course, the follow-up shared decision making. Yeah, and those are the elements of my, my common ground program, right? And, um, but they're universal in that sense, right? They really do work in a variety of settings, and it's very recovery-oriented. That's very interesting. Um, and I'm, I, of course, I immediately go to what kind of research agenda could be attached to such a center. Would you see higher degrees of um, activation, people I I engagement? The big issue you raised, Max, is people not even knowing something had happened at the meeting. Would, would that begin to shift? That's interesting. Good. That's, that's a project worth doing. I'd get in there fast. <laughs> and the fourth group? What'd you come up with? Someone? Do we know? Someone willing to share? We've got a good mic here. Thank you for doing this. I know it's hard. Okay. So uh, we were mostly discussing uh, how might we integrate uh, decision support centers here in our reality, which is, uh, which is very fragmented in terms of uh, treatment and rehab systems. And, and especially if we consider, we, we also discussed that idea. One, one of the ideas we came up with is really using the platform of the rehab uh, uh, committees uh, as a platform to uh, raise um, like power statements and maybe integrate within the existing forms another page where people can express a more uh, uh, individualized uh, goal and uh, uh, personal, uh, personal, uh, um, what he wants to achieve because uh, I, we talked about how those uh, those platforms are mostly they derive their discussions from the existing services rather than from what people want for their lives. So people come to the committee and then they have to kind of choose if they want a housing or uh, um, you know occupational rehab uh, program. But uh, I'm not sure how well the committee understands what this person really wants for, his, for their lives. And then as a result, we see many of the decisions not being implemented at all. So maybe it can help. Um, so apart from preparing for the for the rehab committees, we also discussed uh, other possibilities where we can use the existing uh, infrastructures. Um, like we have a program for uh, <laughs> my English blows away when I'm standing here. <laughs> um, we have those uh, program for people with this, with mental disabilities to be integrated within community centers for uh, leisure activities. So maybe this is one platform where we can uh, build like, or or another idea was the family centers. In those infrastructures that already exist, maybe we can have a few hours a week where peer specialists. Uh, are available for those uh, uh, decision support programs. Um, I'm still, 
I'm still wondering about how all those power statements can, especially regarding personal medication and how can I use psychiatric medication for my life's service, how, how will these messages will be delivered to the doctors eventually and to the treatment systems because, because of that fragmentation? And uh, we still have to think about that because uh, otherwise, you know, it will be nice to discuss those issues, but uh, people will not benefit from them if they don't, their doctors will never hear about those power statements and their goals. So I don't think we have no solution for that yet. Thank you so much. Great ideas. Yeah, great, great ideas. Did you have your hand up? Yes. No? no? Okay. Did, did you have any? No. That's it. Okay. Well, those sound like very productive conversations. And, you know, that idea of dare to dream, right? Dare to, to dream that dream. And then, st you know, just don't say never. But when you think about it, I mean, think about the tremendous victory of, of the mental health reform legislation that's passed already. And no, it's far from perfect, right? It's not all the way there. But it is a long, long way from everybody going into long-term hospitalization and never seeing the light of day. You know, think about that when I think about progress sometimes and, you know, so congratulations. What I'd like to do in my final short lecture here is to talk to you about another uh, way of thinking about our work, another tool, um, and another way to, uh, to think about what we're doing and what might help. Um, so I'm calling this uh, recovery heuristics a teaching tool. Um, and so um, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm hoping most of you got a chance to take this course online, um, how many of you actually got to take the course online? Oh, yay, a bunch of you, OK. Um, and so uh, let me just tell you something interesting about uh, the, the technical background. Oh, but I probably didn't mention this, but I do run a small company now uh, and are able to build these technologies through, through my little company. Um, but we use uh, the, the platform that you went to, the place where you went to is my website, right, to take this course. But the website, imagine this, it's a pretty nifty website, kind of slick. And I think that the learning module that you took is pretty nice, too. It's smooth, and, um, and it's uh, very, um, you can manipulate it in a lot of good ways. That I didn't build that platform um, and was able to build the whole website without knowing how to code. And so this is very important for us, because it's an incredible new opportunity. And we use this platform called Kajabi, which is out there on the internet, and anybody can use it. So it's K-A-J-A-B-I. K-A-J-A-B-I. And I swear I don't work for them, and this is not a paid advertisement. But to find a product that's very, very reasonably priced, that will allow you to build a very appealing website without having to write any code, kajabi.com, K-A-J-A-B-I.com, kajabi.com. And, um, and you not only, without having to write any code, can create an entire kind of web interface, right, a, a site, but then it also can be completely customized to whatever your con course content is going to be without having to know any coding. And the thing that's really real out there is that finances are stretched in the public mental health system. So one of the things we need to be thinking about all the time is, um, and the question I get asked over and over and over again, yeah, Pat, we love having you come, come talk to us. We love having you come do workshops, you know, but it doesn't scale. Do you, does this word translate pretty well, the idea of an intervention scaling? So does somebody have, a, have help for me on that to make sure we all know what I mean by that? Um, add up to, to reach 
very, very large numbers of people with the intervention um, that you're hoping to, that they will learn and use. It's different than dissemination. It has to scale easily. In other words, if you do it with, in other words, I can come and I can offer a workshop on power statements. That's going to cost a lot of money to bring me out, and I do it once. And people are like, we love it when you come and do a training, but we can't afford to keep bringing you back. Um, what we want is to have Pat Deegan in a box. We want to be able for her to reach everybody in our system uh, at the hospital, but we all don't work on the same day, and some of us work at night, and some in the daytime. How can we get Pat Deegan in a box to, to reach everybody working in our system with, with, that, with that course, with that content, with that, in other words, that's cost effective. It's called economies of scale, right? You're going to scale up. So let me let's think of one more example. Um, another example would be make it. Easily use it in their own organizations. And it's not so much implementation, but that it's, it's not cost prohibitive. Do we, do we think we've got it? What's that? Red for scaling. OK. You want it to be able to get it out, you want it to be cost effective, and you want it to be able to be reached by anybody who wants to use it. it has to be all those three things. It needs to be accessible, it needs to be um, available widely, and the cost needs to be very small, right? So the reason I'm telling you about Kajabi as a platform, I mean, we live in the internet age, right? Everything we do is pretty much online, so isn't mental health. It just has to, we have to get there. If we're going to carry a message of rehabilitation, a message of recovery, we have got to start entering robustly that world, that digital world. It's a, just a digital reality, and it is. <laughs> and we just have to start getting there. Um, because if we don't get there, you know who else is going to get there? <laughs> um, and that's what I've had as a major problem with the, do you, I'm sure you have a lot of electronic health records here in Israel, right? What they did, this was very troubling to me, with electronic health records is they took all of the old forms from the hospitals and the old way of practicing and they converted the forms to a digital format and threw them into a program. And by doing that, what they ended up doing is taking all the old ideas digitizing them and making them the way we practice. By changing what we do in a digital environment, we can change what clinicians ask about. So for instance, in the O model, clinicians would sit down with pieces of paper and you'd have charts that were you know, this thick and you'd flip through them and all of that. And they would have a series of forms they would have to fill out by pen every time. So they would ask the person, um, how many animals have you tortured and killed? Um, so how long have you been hallucinating for? In other words, what they were asking were disease questions, right? So then we went and along came electronic health records and we took those questionnaires, how many animals have you killed? How do you, the same, how, how's your hallucinations? And we just put them and made them digital and they appear on a computer screen instead of a piece of paper, right? There is an incredible opportunity. What if clinicians ask different questions, like what is your power statement? How do you want treatment to help you? Tell me about your personal medicine, you know, the things you do to help yourself. 
What if clinicians started acting, asking those questions? And what if, what if, <laughs> what if the computer wouldn't let them complete their report until those questions, you know how electronic health records do that. You can't close the page until you answer the questions. That's what I'm talking about, about structural re-engineering of the care pathway. And we all kind of went along with it. Um, and I was kind of out there shouting, wait a minute, we got to jump on this band. We've got to get our questions into the health record. Hence, I'm creating software now. And I didn't ever want to create software. But if I feel like if I don't go there with the common ground software, we're, I'm, I'm going to get too far behind. So now I hire engineers who work with me and we create software and all of that. You do what you got to do to close that gap between what is and what should be, right? So Kajabi is another one of these opportunities. Kajabi is an opportunity. It's a platform and it's empty until you, it's like having a canvas until you draw on it. And you can build all your own content, okay? And it's not hard to do and you don't need to be technical to do it. And um, it scales. It doesn't cost much for us to do it, and it scales. So if we could go into a mental health center or a, um, and say, you know, we have an online course that will help with staff orientation, that every new staff person coming to work at an organization has to take our psych rehab, recovery champion, whatever our organization is, ISPRA, you have to take our courses and it's available to all the staff and guess what? They can do it um, at their own pace. They can do a little bit tonight, they can do a little bit tomorrow morning, the thing will say. And not only that, but I can give them a little test ahead of time and a little post test after and show that some changes have been made in their attitudes toward recovery, a pre and a post test. And then they take the course. That scales. That takes a burden. That's a solution. We're offering a recovery solution. Now, I want you guys to get there first because I know who else is out there developing coursework, OK? And this is part of our future. It's not the whole future, but it is definitely part of the future, and we can get out front here through this tool called, called Kajabi. Um, and uh, as I said, it, I have a very tiny company, and, and we can afford to do it, and it works. So here's what is going on with this uh, Kajabi course that you took uh, on my website. It lo it, you don't even see Kajabi. It looks like my website, which it makes it even cooler, right? Um, it makes me look like a big corporation when in fact there's, you know, seven of us <laughs> behind the curtain. Uh, but this came out of a real need. And the need that it came out of was the uh, fact that clinicians, many clinicians, as you know, were trained to think that the stress of going to work would cause people to relapse and send them back to the hospital. And that it was best for the clinician not to refer people to supported employment. So all over the United States, we've got supported employment teams like you have in Israel, individual placement and support. But the problem is sometimes the doctor will say or the therapist will say, in my clinical opinion, this person is not ready for work. I can see Marianne Farkas coming in on a white charger saying, oh, readiness for work, yes. Well, how do we teach? clinicians to think differently about the risk, because there are risks, in returning to work. Risk management is one of the most important concerns because a professional's license is hanging in the balance. Okay? And they, people care a lot, as they should, about their licenses. And so I developed work and the dignity of risk as a way to teach clinicians about a framework that I've developed, the dignity of risk and the duty to care. And why that's important is because, I'll be honest with you, yes, recovery is important, but we have not done a good job in the recovery field at providing solutions for the very real challenges 
that everyday clinicians are facing, and I don't, case managers that they're facing day in and day out. And so when I talk about a, a risk framework or a, or a heuristic, I'm talking about something like this work and the dignity of risk. So where does something like that come from? <clears throat> well, early on in my career, I began to notice, as I said earlier today, that everybody that I've ever met can get on board with some of the foundational principles of recovery. Hope, collaboration, goals, we need to be person-centered and holistic, we need to, um, these are foundational. And everyone goes, yes, that's true, yay. And then they go back to work the next day and do what they do. People jump on this. They're good with that. But the rubber meets the road is a saying we have back in the States. And that's where, where the interesting stuff begins to happen. When the, when the tires meet the, the gravel of the road and we're accelerating, then what happens? When we're driving, OK? And everybody that's working clinically in the field, once I start talking about self-determination for people with early psychosis, self-determination for people with severe mental illness, I'm asked, but what if they make a bad choice, Pat? Are you telling me that a person in psychosis who's getting ready to jump off a bridge I should let them be self-determining about that? You understand how this works, right? I'm introducing a concept, self-determination. People having goals, making choices about their own lives rather than being told what to do. That's what we say for recovery, right? And frankly, a lot of clinicians will look at you like, yeah, right. They're not saying that because they're dumb. They're saying that because there are very good reasons to doubt that statement, that someone with a diagnosis of a psychotic disorder, okay, may in fact uh, not always make the best choices. And clinicians are there trying to grapple with that, right? And we come along with our recovery solutions that don't get to the heart of what really clinicians are struggling with. I think we've done a bad job of that, and that's an area we all can improve in, okay? If we are serious about scaling recovery, okay, not only do we need a, a digital platform and online coursework, which is the future of how we learn, but we also need heuristics, frameworks that actually speak to the reality that clinicians are struggling with, that people, case managers, that uh, personal care attendants out in the field are working with. And so that's what this course uh, was all about, that I created a heuristic. This is a heuristic. This is a framework. And I'm able to say, and then I'm going to tell you how I created this, that very often, and this is just a brief review of the framework, because I know you were, were in the course, but basically, uh, the framework that I eventually was able to evolve and that we use often and that really helps is uh, that the instinct of clinicians is to overprotect. Not because we're evil and dumb but be and not because we're not recovery oriented. It's because we care about the person. I don't want to see harm come to this person that I care about. Oh, and by the way, if I'm negligent about care, I'll lose my license, which is another powerful motivator. So I'll try to overprotect and tell you what to do and make your choices for you and even go to the extent of forcing you to make the right choice. If you decide to go work out of town and go to school out of town far away from your care team, we might have to be looking at putting you in the hospital. Clearly, you're lacking insight into the fact that you're not well, OK? Overprotect. When the person goes ahead and makes their choice anyway, teams, case managers, therapists, very often go, well, Pat Deegan said recovery is about choice. They just made a terrible choice. Their life is getting ruined. I guess we'll just have to let them make their choice. 
and they stand back. There's nothing we can do. That's neglect. It's not empowerment. That's neglect, and teams do it all the time. So once overprotect is thwarted, people bang, go to neglect. And what I did in my heuristic was say, wait a minute, there are two principles that we can apply, two of them, that are deeply recovery oriented, that come out of the disability rights movement, and that will help us navigate these extremes. Because this is not recovery oriented practice, and this is not recovery oriented practice. Recovery oriented practice is in here. And these are hard situations where there's no easy, we call them a cookbook. I want to cook some cookies. Oh, I go to this recipe, bing, 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 I got cookies. That's not how a heuristic works. A heuristic is a framework that I can apply that serves to guide me. It's not a cookbook. And I cannot find every answer I need in a simple fashion. Okay? So this, well, how did, where, where did this come from? Um, this uh, heuristic. And it came, if you can believe it, in order to get to the neglect overprotect continuum and the dignity of risk and the duty to care, that, that very simple, straightforward heuristic or framework, I started in the mid 1990s to get it to where it's at today. Um, and my process was to listen, to iterate, and to deliver and delivery, to pay attention to these three things. So <clears throat> let me, uh, listen of course means listening. Iterate means to uh, try again and try again and do it a little differently and a little differently until I got to what I like, to what I saw was actually working. And delivery means, well, so what if you've got something great, how are you gonna let people know about it, Pat? So that's what delivery is all about, it's dissemination. Okay, so listen. <clears throat> So, I think sometimes in rehab and clinical, um, I'm sorry, in, in rehab and, and recovery, we don't do as great a job listening. And I began by listening. And I began by listening to residential workers, personal care attendants. I began by listening to therapists. I began listening and listening and collecting stories, stories of where people were like, it's really, really hard um, to support choice. Here's a very typical kind of thing I heard as I was collecting these stories. A client makes the choice not to take out the garbage in a supported living apartment. If repeated efforts to engage the client in performing this task fail, should staff let the client suffer the natural consequences of this choice? Should staff take out the garbage? Are staff made service? If staff take out the garbage, are they enabling the clients to continue to make terrible choices? Have you heard this before? All the time. What have we provided case managers, residential workers, supportive? What have we given them besides self-determination as a principle of recovery? We need to do more. So I'm challenging us to do more. What we need to provide people with, if recovery is ever really going to take hold, is a framework that works, that helps clinicians avoid the extremes of neglect and overprotect, and that operationalize recovery practice knowing that it can never be a cookbook. <laughs> we can't say if X, then Y. We can't. It's not that simple. There are too many shades of gray. But listening, listening. What are those things that the, the staff keep asking us about that make it really difficult to do the work? A client refuses to go to the dentist and has not been in the last four years. Some of his front teeth look like they are abscessing. Regulations say the client should go annually. What should we do? Force them to go? Very often, residential staff, those poor guys, they don't get paid a lot of money, those staff, and yet they're supposed to somehow get this guy to the dentist. Or you don't meet regulation. And your program gets punished 
for not complying with regulation. What are you supposed to do? You know? Then, then when they realize, I can't like physically throw the guy in the car, strap him down and ha take him to the dentist. That's not gonna work. So I've tried everything I could think of. Neglect, I give up. You know what, I'm gonna wait till his abscess teeth begin hurting him so bad, then he'll suffer the natural consequences of his choice, and then he'll get his ass to the dentist. Friends, this is what our workforce is dealing with. And so when we say they don't get on board with recovery, it's because I believe in part, not the whole story, but in part, we're not doing a good enough job of giving them frameworks to use and to apply. And then in order to do that, we must first listen over and over again in a systematic way, collect this information. A client keeps drinking large quantities of coffee, even though he knows it triggers his aggression. What am I supposed to do? This is where the workforce is living, guys. And unless we can make rehab and recovery speak to these issues, then, and, and more, oh, there's many, many more. Try professional boundaries as a whole area, you know? Anyway, I'm just giving you one example of an area. So listen, so what I did to listen was I began a series of focus groups uh, with regular staff, not the bosses, not, just regular staff out there working. And I just began to collect examples. In this case, I was interested in the topic of choice and self-determination. What what, tell me about the times when you feel really good about a choice that someone makes. And tell me about a time when you just feel like the person's making a terrible choice. Give me examples from your work. And what did you do? And what worked? And what didn't work? And collect, collect, collect that data. And somewhere in all of that data, search <coughs> for the framework. So listening, we gotta do a better job of listening. Then I began to iterate. And in the beginning, I thought I was seeing patterns in what I was learning as I listened. And the patterns uh, included the fact that it seemed to me that sometimes people found themselves in what I called, and I don't expect you to read this, I just wanted to see the complexity of this thing. You know that neglect over protect continuum? That's the iteration years down the road. This is where I was beginning. This was my heuristic to start with. And what it is is a flow chart, a decision chart, right? And what I learned when I listened to people is sometimes Clients make choices I feel comfortable in. I feel comfortable with the choice the client is making. Yay. And we both get along really good then and I love my job. <coughs> then clients make choices that I feel conflicted about. Internally, because I care about this person, I feel conflicted. Don't, don't. You got to go to the dentist. Please don't go through this. It's unnecessary suffering. Don't. And then what would happen is my feeling as the staff of feeling conflicted became a conflict between me and the client. How do I get you to the dentist became the question. How, what, 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 I'm going to push you, cajole you, threaten you, bribe you. I'm going to take you out for coffee when we're done with the dentist appointment. Are we going? Nope. Then there's a zone where it's like, and I ended up calling this the non-negotiable zone. That's when a client is making a decision, not just to not go to the dentist, but now there's an infection from the abscess tooth that's going to the brain, okay? And now we're in a situation of imminent risk. Now, that's a whole other ball game. So I was able to parse out the comfort zone, the conflicted zone, and the non-negotiable zone. That's where I started after listening. And then I was able to come up with decision trees. If you're in the conflicted zone, don't abandon the client. Do remain engaged. Let your feelings be, con uh, don't let your feelings become a uh, conflict between you and the individual. 
So anyway, that's where I started, okay? And I got some traction with that. I got some traction. Um, but it wasn't enough. I needed to continue to iterate uh, over time. And then eventually I was able to come to the neglect over protect continuum. Now I see this uh, framework uh, in use all the time in the first episode psychosis teams. That's very powerful because these teams have highly skilled psychiatrists, people that I truly admire who are really grappling in a real way with what does recovery mean when you're working with a 16-year-old person you know, who thinks that there are snakes in his belly but who wants to return to work but can't have a coherent conversation yet. What do we do? What do we do? A person, anyway, you, you, know the, you know the scenes, right? Really difficult, complicated stuff. And I've taught them the neglect over protect continuum and how to apply it in their work. So if you come to uh, an on high fidelity on track team, what you will find is routinely, as we're doing clinical care consultations on very difficult, challenging situations with individuals, you'll hear the psychiatrist talking about, oh, it sounds like we're getting into overprotect there. Or it sounds like um, uh, we're really forgetting the duty to care. I'm hearing that he wants to be self-determining, but my duty to care buttons are being pushed right now, and I need to, how can I exercise my care in this scenario? It's remarkable to see it in use. It's simple, but it stands the test of reality it speaks to clinicians because it's real. Because the origins of the framework, the origins of the heuristic, this teaching tool, came out of their experience where the rubber meets the road, where they're struggling. It wasn't me going on high and lecturing to them about the importance of self-determination. They get it, sort of. With this, they can do their job. It speaks to where they're coming from. It's a solution. So my big message to you is that we, as a field, as a discipline, as leaders, need to get better at offering solutions to people, to clinicians, if we want to, quote, teach, if we want to teach recovery. We need to offer solutions. Then the third component, so it was listen, iterate, delivery, okay? At first, what I did was take my heuristic, my framework, the decision tree, conflicted zone, comfort zone, non-negotiable zone, all, and I packaged the whole thing up into a, 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 work, a, a big uh, manual that I called intentional care. And one section of intentional care was all about <clears throat> choice, How, a recovery-oriented approach to supporting client choice, okay? And it came with a video of me talking about recovery and then very clear instructions about how to use the decision tree. And we made this available for, I think it was $500 for the whole package, and it included things like navigating professional boundaries, supporting client choice, all the places where the rubber meets the road, if you will, the, the, where, where clinicians and regular workers struggle. <clears throat> and we got very little traction, very little traction. Um, and so because of, I think because of the progression of, and, and the availability of uh, new kinds of platforms, I also had to continue to iterate <clears throat> how we deliver good heuristics. <clears throat> In other words, it's not just enough to develop great tools. It just isn't. They can be brilliant, these tools, and what we write <clears throat> and our heuristics, brilliant. But they won't get used unless <clears throat> we can figure out an efficient, affordable, and highly scalable method to deliver the information, okay? And so delivery is a huge part of the battle. And so today, one of our options, this is a page from my website, and this is where you can click and get into the work and dignity of risk course. 
is the opportunity for e-learning. E-learning, right? And as I said, the Kajabi pa platform is very powerful because you don't need to know how to code to make that course. I upload the videos, I upload the quizzes, all myself. So that's the age we're living in now, where we can create these uh, learning opportunities. And I think to be successful, they really have to meet clinicians. They, they, we need to present our tools as solutions, as opposed to being, let me tell you what you don't know. No, no, it's like, let me help you do your job better. And recovery principles, when applied in the real world, will help you do your job better. Where are the places where you're struggling in your job? And how can recovery frameworks and practical heuristics help you be the good clinician you want to be, the good worker you want to be? We've got to do that, guys. We've, we've really got to do that. And I want to teach, t tell you one other thing that I'm learning, because this is still very much uh, uh, part of you know, I'm, I'm in the process too. I'm learning all the time. I'm just here sharing with you what I'm learning. We've stumbled onto a really powerful combination. What, um, what I told you earlier in the day um, and is that we know that didactic teaching, me standing up here, uh, me on a video, and you're watching the video online, goes a little far, but it's not enough to transfer into practice. I want what I'm teaching to get into practice. That's what I care about. That's how systems can change, right? So the key to making that happen is coaching. Coaching is great. You have a champion, you have somebody very skilled, and then I provide coaching. But here's the thing about coaching. Coaching does not scale. It's time intensive. It costs a lot of money to get a highly skilled coach, and then you've got to coach your entire workforce. How's that going to scale? How are we going to reach a critical mass of people with this information that will include not just online lectures and videos of someone talking, and not just little tests to test your understanding, but also the ability to coach people in the practice? So what we've stumbled into in my company that seems to be really giving us some great results right now is that we provide the online piece, class one, and a test to make sure you understood what you were learning. Then you have to do some homework. You need to practice, right? So you do a little bit of homework, right? And then you come into a live webinar. And I'll have 20, 25 people in a live webinar. And what we're doing in the webinar is discussing our homework, where we had problems, where we didn't. We're not doing any PowerPoints. There are no PowerPoints in there. It's nothing but I tried to take it to work and use it, and this happened. I forgot my password and I didn't do it, <laughs> or whatever the barriers might be. Um, and that seems to be uh, scalable within reason. I mean, 20, you can't do coaching with like 50 people at the same time, but 20 is better than one at a time. Um, and added to this very scalable online solution, it seems to, it really seems to be working. So I've said an awful lot today. And I'd like to, you know, we've got some time left, and I'd really like to use it in any way that makes sense to you. I, I hope some of what I said um, was challenging to us. It's all meant not as criticisms of any of us, but just my sharing what I've been learning with you and hopes of encouraging you to think it, about things, perhaps coming at it from some different ways. Do people have questions, concerns? Do you want to debate, or do you have a different experience with uh, how to teach recovery, you can teach me. I'm very open to learning from you. Or just to hear what you're walking away with today, or my favorite question is after us having spent nearly six hours together, when you go back to work, what might you do differently tomorrow after having spent this time together? 
Um, one of the things I'm going to do is study up more on the service baskets, because I think some of the ideas you guys were generating is, is very, very good. I want to understand that better. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sure, sure, sure. Thanks, Warren. So, so yeah, I think I'm, I'm glad that you're going to uh, take that idea away with you because I'll be honest with you, recovery isn't rocket science. It just isn't. You know, I have a very simple working definition that recovery means um, having a job and a, a date and a paycheck on a Friday or here on a, on a Thursday, <laughs> right? It'd be like, yes. Um, and uh, I think that... Um, what, we, what can be very challenging is when we meet a person with complex needs and who seems to be really struggling in their lives and their life is filled with lots of challenges, to offer an equally complex um, solution. Whereas the truth is when any of us are seeking to change something about our lives, very often we just st start with a single step. I can't even look at the whole big picture. I just need to focus on one small part to get started. And that, um, so we go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, eat more fiber and exercise more and lose weight and oh yeah, quit smoking. Like what, by tomorrow? You want me to do all that by tomorrow? No, no, I can't do that by tomorrow. 10 years, maybe, <laughs> right? So, so I think simple things like a power statement. How do you want treatment to help you? What matters to you? And how can we help you get to what matters to you? Simple, simple, pragmatic, disruptive, transformative. Because people will, who've been in the system will say to you, how should I know I'm mentally ill? You're the doctor, aren't you? Fix me. I'm not kidding. You know this, right? That's why I do think that these profoundly fundamental and simple tools are kind of, they shake the ground. They're exciting. Wait a minute. When I ask someone about their personal medicine, you know, the things you do that get you out of bed in the morning. That's medicine? What is that for? Yeah. Um, I like to walk my dog. Tell me about walking your dog. Do you even walk when it's snowing out with the dog? Yeah, my puppy comes alive in the cold weather and we walk together. And you see the person transforming in front of you. They begin to kind of glow. And they're telling you about what matters to me. And when somebody does that, it's life altering because they say things like, I never knew that something good could come from within me. I thought I was crazy. What they're really saying is, the me I have internalized the message that there's nothing of wisdom in me. And I'm saying, no, no, no. You're part of the solution. You're not the problem. What do you already know how to do that helps? You know how to do something. Bring that forward, celebrate that, and we've started. We're on the way. We're activated. We're beginning. Right? Power statement. How do you want treatment to help? Wow. 
Imagine asking somebody that. <laughs> so simple. But when you formalize it and you make it into a highly usable tool that doesn't take all kinds of money and you don't need a PhD to do a power statement, right? I get, incre I think in the paper I shared with you on that, I think we looked at 27,000 power statements and we had a response rate that was very, very high. And this is in real world practice, not in some lab somewhere, right? It's in the real world. Um, but we need to create the infrastructure. In other words, if there were no decision support center, we would not have the power statements done routinely. You need to, you need to be thinking about what's going to support the practice in terms of that. You know, I, I do like the term care pathway and re-engineering it. What needs to be inserted? What needs to be taken out of the little steps I go through to get to see the doctor in order for me to be able to have the outcome I want? That's how we got to be thinking, I think. So thanks, it's a great question. And yes, these are extremely simple tools. And that's their power. <laughs> that's a very disruptive idea. Yes? Please. Yes, we need to keep our dreams and our passions alive and in the front of us. Um, and sometimes it takes longer to get the job done. A lot of people would say, if you're doing a dissertation, make it on a regular topic and just get out. <laughs> Hurry up and finish. Um, if you're going to put your passion and, and do a piece on, on, on spirituality, that's so desperately needed in our field. That's one of those areas where if we listen to clinicians, they get very squirmy and they're not sure how to work with that at all. If we could provide a heuristic, a heuristic, that would be interesting. Maybe if I was your advisor, I'd be like, get out and listen, iterate, and deliver. Let me know what you come up with, right? Because uh, that's a very important area. And you know, when we, uh, we've got, um, you know, uh, millions of uh, types of personal medicine we've collected through the computer program, and we help people discover their personal medicine, spirituality. But you can't just say spirituality to meet fidelity you have to be able to say like, so reading scripture, when I'm feeling anxious, helps me relax and trust in my God. Wow. And if you're giving me medicine that doesn't allow me to connect with my higher power, there's a problem. And I've got a leg to stand on because of my personal medicine to say that. Powerful stuff. Keep it up. <laughs> Disruptive. <laughs> Other thoughts? What might you go away with? What might you do different? What, what seed is stirring inside of you? What wild, outrageous, disruptive idea do you have? Yeah, be wild. <laughs> so um, I, 
I listened to, um, I think it was the, the second uh, lecture you, you gave us. Um, and my, I don't know, natural, I go, I'm angry. And I go to, <laughs> I look at psychiatry and, and drugs and all of these things. I have a radical point of view. And I listen to, to this, um, these tools. I loved it. And then I said, but, it, it, but this system needs to like, be erased <laughs> and built from new. And in my, in my, like, that's what I, that's my first thought. Yeah. And, and then I kept listening to you, and I think what I'm taking with me is when you said just do it, don't, don't talk about it. You can't go to a psychiatrist and start explaining recovery. And it's not, I do a lot of talking, but just do it. It, it, and things happen. I think that's um, something I'm taking with me. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. you know, one of the ways I think about us and our movement and mental health system reform or mental health system revolution and all of that stuff is that we all need one another. We need to think of ourselves as a community. And as um, um, so a lot of us are working within the system, trying to promote change uh, within the system. But my good friend David Oakes, uh, who is the uh, founder of Mind, Mind Freedom International, which is a very radical uh, group that is an international group who want to see the full overthrow of the mental health system, okay? As David taught me, in order to cook an omelet, you need a flame. And he says, Mind Freedom is the flame, and they're going to keep rattling the doors and shaking things up. But I embrace that fire and say, cook that omelet, baby, because I'm in here stirring the eggs, you know? You know what I'm saying? That we're all in this together. Yeah. And, and yeah, when we get to the point where, you know, we can squabble about certain things, but gosh, there's so much work to be done, there's room for everybody. So I appreciate many divergent points of view. Yeah, good for you. Others? Yeah. Well. Beautiful. To find ourselves where we're at on that continuum, yeah. And to remember that it's never about, a lot of times, the, one of the errors that's made with the framework is um, uh, first we apply the duty to care, then the dignity of risk, or you know, what order. No, 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 it's at the same time. We apply them both at the same time. That's the trick of doing good work. So much, it does hope. Hope's powerful. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And go ahead, and, and then I'll get.
Well, I do think that any student coming into uh, or that's going to have any kind of professional interface with mental health needs to go through the hearing distressing voices experience, whether you're studying to become a police officer uh, or, or whatever it might be. Um, I think that students benefit tremendously by hearing the stories of people who themselves have the lived experience of their own recovery. So I'm always an advocate for bringing an individual or a panel of individuals into a classroom because as um, Pat Corrigan teaches us, the way you overcome the stigma is through actual contact and having met somebody. And where you get to, it's a kind of a no humiliation zone you have to create in the classroom where people can ask really dumb questions. Like, are you violent? You know, did you ever really hurt anybody? And not feel like, oh, that's so wrong of me to ask. Um, so it's a good teacher that can create that kind of environment where people feel free to ask uh, questions. Um, so I do think that the lived experience is very important to expose students to. That and the simulation kind of experiences can be very formative. Um, but another place I think where we sometimes fail students is when they leave the classroom, they get pumped up about new ideas. <coughs> and they're like, yeah, recovery, yeah. Then they get out into the field and they ask things like, but he won't go to the dentist. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> Unless we can be with them as supervisors, mentors, with these tools at our fingertips, so anyway, I can't wait to come back and hear about the amazing tools that you guys are going to develop in the future. Challenge yourself. You, you know how to do it. I mean, it's just, just let, be, let your imagination be wild. Just get crazy, I'm telling you. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for having me. It's been a good day.